Hi, uh, it's Constantine Kogan again, and today I'm hosting uh, Mika Matsumura, uh, managing partner in Gumi Crypto uh, Capital and co-founder of Evercoin. Hi, Miko. Hi, hi, nice to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's my honor, you know, like we, <laughs> Miko is a venture capitalist, a speaker and entrepreneur, and uh, uh, he is also a venture capital uh, partner in Bitbull Capital, so that's how we know each other. And uh, uh, we've met in, I don't know how many conferences, how many investor launches. And the thing about Miko uh, is uh, he's an exceptional uh, speaker, not only because he has a unique ability to articulate, you know, complex subjects and to digest them into like, you know, uh, biteable <laughs> sides, but also because he has an in-depth understanding of the open uh, finance infrastructure. And uh, before we get into your experience, Nico, and your exceptional results, I just want to also <laughs> throw a legal disclaimer, which is important. Uh, so this content is for informational purposes only, and you should not construe any such information or other materials, legal, tax, investment, or financial advice. And now we're free to go. And I think, you know, as a as a uh, as a partner in you know in venture capital fund and investor, you know, in many funds. Yeah, I think you're invested in Pantera Capital and uh, you know in many other uh, funds. So. Uh, how do you see your investment uh, investments in blockchain technology? What you know, what is unique about it, and why you actually chosen this path? Yeah, so uh, I can talk a little bit about how I got into this, and it's very interesting. Which is, you know, in a sense, uh, I was a little bit uncertain about the gains that were being had in the stock market, you know, and I was really kind of thinking that it was really. Uh, relatively uncertain with respect to kind of how it was being uh, built and so from my perspective one of the things that I ended up doing is hedging into kind of cash and then at some point I started looking at the cash and thinking well cash is uncertain so I have to hedge into other things uh, I, I found international currencies were also uncertain you know and so really uh, you know I originally found my way into uh, blockchain-based assets on this basis of kind of hedging, right? So the thing that's very interesting from this perspective is is that, you know, you can also hedge uh, all kinds of, of thoughts that you have, right? Because in a way, this is all based on what Peter Thiel describes in his book, Zero to One. Fantastic book. And, you know, his idea is that investors are people who don't know what to do. That's the, really the, in some ways, a foundational definition of what an investor is. And I think it's a very salient point because, you know, if an investor were a person who did know what to do, then they would go do that. Right. So, you know, if they really felt like, OK, I'm going to create this company called the Facebook and it's going to become this giant dodecacorn it's going to become one of the biggest companies in the world, you know, and eventually, you know, claw its way up towards the. It's not there yet, but it's clawing its way up toward the trillion dollar market cap club, right? And, and you know, so if if Peter Thiel knew what he was supposed to do, he would just go do that, right? So, so the idea that what you do instead of knowing what to do is you hedge. So hedging is really just a function of like, okay, well, here's here's my thesis, right? But if you want to have kind of... So to me, there's a couple of things you need to do, like, you know, obviously... Um, I, I really enjoyed your previous show with Dan Moorhead and he was talking about asymmetric assets, right? So obviously you can kind of really look at the asymmetric quality of an asset, but the thing that's really interesting about it is, is that the asset isn't asymmetric until proven asymmetric, right? So in a sense, all, it's just a theory. So, so the idea then is what do you do with your own theories, right? And the idea of your own theory is that you hedge the theory. So the idea would be, you know, okay, so I'm going to invest in uh, something like a Bitcoin. But then at the same time, in order to hedge things that exist in the market like public equities, right? But then at the same time as you're doing that, then you think, well, how do I get potentially more alpha in terms of increasing my sharp ratio? So then at that point, you know, so it's really what I'm saying is I'm saying, can you find other assets 
that may allow you to expose yourself differently to the risk. And that, of course, includes venture capital. But the thing that's so interesting about being a general partner is, is if you want to hedge that, you can actually be like, well, what if I'm not that good? It's because I'm a first time general partner in a fund. I'm pretty happy about how it's going. But I would say that overall, the thing that's really interesting becomes, what if there are uh, people that are better at that than me? So you hedge by becoming an LP. So you invest in their fund. So for example, Pantera, like they're provably good at, the, at this, right? So one way to hedge the thesis. So to me, my base thesis is that I'm, I'm good at this, <laughs> you know, but obviously you also have to look at and say, okay, well, what if I'm not good at this? How do I manage that risk? You know, so then, you know, so that's a manager risk. And so I diversify by investing in other managers who I think are great. So, you know, that's, and I've, I've known uh, Paul from uh, Pantera for, for many years. And, and so, you know, he's someone who I trust. And so I feel like that's a, that's a way of hedging. So, you know, I, I think the mindset behind a lot of the inv pattern of investment is really, you know, necessarily driven by uh, hedging risk. No, no, hundred percent. And I, I've seen your journey personally, uh, becoming from like uh, from limited partner LP, as you mentioned, becoming a general partner, and I think that there, that's the beauty of this particular market. There's uh, so many opportunities, and uh, there is still, uh, you know, it's a nascent asset class. There's a lot of infrastructure is being built, right? And if we're talking about the uh, open infrastructure, you know, open finance infrastructure, like. I think there's a the people sometimes even confused. What does it even mean? Like you know, we're, we were throwing a lot of like uh, terms, you know, which might be technical, DeFi, decentralized finance, you know, like uh, permissionless blockchains, and all. And I, I feel like people missing are like the core elements of this. What are we even, you know, what are we even yeah, like, I, 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 evolutionizing? I you know, yeah. Yeah, I love the question because uh, you know I, I consider myself to be someone who reasons based on sort of. Uh, fundamentals, right? So I'm very interested in fundamental reasoning. So for me, uh, you know, there's an entire field that I come from, which is open source software. So open source software, which, you know, it's been around for decades, right? And I, you know, I've been around for decades, uh, you know, and so this, and I've been around it for decades. And open source software really is reflective of a culture. It's reflective of a, of a specific tool chain. So, you know, things like uh, source code control, and it's really a specific set of licenses, right? So, you know, you can't separate open source from the idea of an open source license, right? Which is really permission to use software, you know, a, a typically a non-commercial permission, you know, uh, but also commercial position that doesn't involve kind of typically license payments, right? So, you know, uh, people call it, free open source software or, you know, FOSS, you know, and free open source software is just become sort of the dominant form of life in software. So, you know, the, so to me, when I talk about, so I use the phrase open source financial infrastructure, right? And that's pretty all embracing. And, you know, what I mean by it's all embracing is, is it's a reminder that the largest, most meaningful uh, assets in this space, the cryptographic asset space, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, and all these really significant assets, they're all open source software, right, at their base, right? So to me, I look at that as open source financial infrastructure, but in order to create the widest lens possible, open source financial infrastructure also includes traditional databases, it includes traditional, you know, things that run traditional banking. So for example, uh, I got my start in Silicon Valley uh, more than 25 years ago, uh, working with the Java programming language team at uh, Sun Microsystems, uh, you know, and that, that was way back in the first dot-com uh, boom, right? And the thing that is interesting there is that, you know, Java is open source software and it's really used uh, quite a bit by banks. And so I think Java is also part of open source financial infrastructure. So when I talk about open source financial infrastructure, what we have to do is understand the history of open source software and how it behaves in order to kind of prognosticate what will happen to 
things that are of more recent interest, like Bitcoin, you know, and blockchain. Right. So in order to understand those phenomena, my lens is really talking about open source software, which is really software that people put on the internet for free, that anyone can download, anyone can run, you know, anyone can use it. And <clears throat> the people who are running it and using it are, are, you know, typically not paying a penny and they can actually hold up a piece of paper that says that they're allowed to do that, right? So it's, it's sort of a, here's my license, which I also downloaded for free. And it says right here that I can do whatever I want with this. And so here I go. And obviously there, the licenses are written in a way so that there are certain things that you can't do. Uh, but like in general, it's pretty liberal. It's pretty free. So, so that's, that's the basis for, uh, you know, what I, what I like to talk about is, you know, open source, uh, financial infrastructure. No, that's, I think, uh, I, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you in terms of like how beautiful it is and how, uh, open-minded, you know, the entire ability to use, you know, something publicly without asking somebody a permission, right? So, uh, and I think they, th that was uh, the core idea also with Bitcoin and the, the, the first initial blockchain, like why people loved it so much, you know, because they they got, you know, sick of uh, tired of what, because of the banks, what they were doing with high fees, you know, remittance and other uh, challenges uh, were, you know, they were ripping all the, the major profits, right? And, and also just at the technological and enterprise level, which basically brings us to the next question. If you can uh, help us to understand from your perspective, what are the major pros and cons if you would compare, let's imagine, uh, public blockchains versus, you know, private blockchains, you know, well, I know that you have a certain view on this. So, you know, few pros and cons. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, uh, right, because uh, there's definitely some controversy there. Uh, my, my idea is, is that largely the notion of a uh, so-called private blockchain, it, it's, it, to me, those are really what I call settings, right? Those are settings, right? And what I mean by their settings is, is that, you know, when you think about open source software, when you think about blockchain, like, uh, what is a blockchain, right? A blockchain is effectively a database replication protocol. That's what it is. It's a replication protocol, right? And what is the design? Like, why why is a blockchain? What is what is it, right? So so to me, like at a minimum, in order to sort of say that you have a legitimate kind of main net of a blockchain, you know, you, you probably ought to be running at least two nodes, right? There probably ought to be at least two nodes, you know, because so that they can replicate, yes. right? Because, because it's not a database, it's a database replication protocol, that's what it is, and it replicates the data, right? So you can't replicate the data on one node, like you, you have to have the second node so you can have that replication, right? So so to me, obviously that's, you know, and then, and then what happens is more and more and more nodes come, right? And obviously as you add more and more nodes, the idea of replication produces reliability, redundancy, immutability, it gives you all these wonderful properties of kind of essentially like a verifiable audit, right? So to me, the idea of like a private blockchain is uh, there's a couple of dimensions around the private aspect, right? So one of the aspects of private is it's related to accessing the information, right? So the idea is my only my group or only my people can access the information on this blockchain. So to me, like, I'm a open source software zealot, but the thing that's really strange about what's happened with Bitcoin is Bitcoin is also open source data, right? Because, you know, and that's the nature of what's called a public blockchain, right? Which is that obviously every single person, not even anyone running a node, but every single human on the internet can actually read the Bitcoin blockchain as long as they kind of know how to do that. But like there's tons of websites that actually kind of do it for you and just present them as web pages. So it's super trivial to like read the entire blockchain and just, I mean, it's fairly large, so it's it's a lot of reading, but like, you know, it's, it's not a problem. So to me, like the idea is obviously 
if you talk about things that are private blockchain, right, it kind of becomes a buzzword, right? Because really all you're saying is you're saying that it's probably open source software, but the data is not open. Right. And, and then obviously, like the, you, the typical users that want that are, are typically people who are doing enterprise software who don't want to kind of publicly disclose their transaction logs. But the thing that's really ironic about all of this is, is that if you look at these kind of, um, you know, cypherpunk privacy coins like Monero or something, um, Zcash. you know, yeah, Zcash, like those blockchains get very hard to read, right? They get very hard to read because the data involves a lot of privacy obfuscation. And so the question then becomes, is that open data or is that, is that a private blockchain? <laughs> is Monero private blockchain? You know, like, so I, I guess I'm, I'm really, you know, again, I, I'm trying, I'm not trying to create obfuscation. I'm really just saying that <clears throat> privacy is almost like a database setting, right? So I, I, I think there are people who get into really strong kind of moral opposition, but <clears throat> you know, I, I feel like it's moral opposition to a setting in a database. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I don't take as much offense at people setting databases however they want to set them. I mean, to me, the, the battleground for me is more whether the code is free. And if you want your data to be free using free code, great. If you want your data to not be free, I think that's okay too. Like I'm, you know, I'm not gonna like come find you and be like you're you're a, you're a moral aberration for how you know the the manner by which you're using this open source software, which by the way has a license that tells you that you can do almost anything you want, right? So like, who am I to say if you want a private blockchain? Like, that's great. Like, go you knock yourself out. <laughs> no, and again, I, I think there's a. <laughs> You, you brought a very reasonable, uh, you know, uh, point that it's all, you know, it's all relative. You know, people who want to share their their data and they prefer to use a public blockchain and they want transparency, they prefer these, you know, like this route of the open finance uh, ideology. I think let them do whatever they want to do, and if they bring value, great. Uh, and I think the market will show whether they're actually like the winners <laughs> and same goes for the private solutions. Listen, listen, like if the banks are willing to risk, you know, like certain things and uh, just test uh, in their small sandbox, you know, certain projects, again, we understand that they have certain um, challenges from the legal and compliance standpoint. So let them do you know their job and then they'll show us the great results maybe and i i i might even think that that can help the adoption uh which uh, actually brings us to the next question um uh, in terms of uh in your opinion like when do you actually see that traditional banking system will uh start massive adoption of uh, of the antiquated you know fintech infrastructure i know it's already happening and we see some of the mo more efficient uh solutions but it's still it's still like you know pretty nascent so what do you think about this maybe you have some good examples to share with you. yeah it's fascinating right because i for me to be a little bit more fair to my colleagues there are certainly people that object to this concept of private blockchain and in a way if you kind of go back to the fundamentals in some ways what they're objecting to is actually more like what I would call enterprise blockchain right because it turns out that you know so instead of things like Monero right so in other words you know some people are like oh private blockchain suck but Monero is great and you know and that those people tend to be more kind of cypherpunk libertarians you know and so therefore how could they be opposed to so-called private blockchains because that's exactly. a blockchain that literally is opaque with how it can be world readable and it obfuscates data right so so i'm really kind of going back to the fundamentals but to me the one of the natural objections that i think are legitimate about enterprise blockchains is that uh, one of the foundations of blockchain is an alternative way of handling trust right and that in a way the thing that's so provable in society is actually that what is extremely expensive is a lack of trust so if you don't 
have trust. Basically, uh, for example, if you see bureaucracy, right? So it's like, okay, file this form out in triplicate and then go to this office, deposit one of the forms, and then take the other two copies of the forms and then mail them to this other address. You know, so, so like when you see bureaucracy, like, you know, if you see that in like, you know, countries with like heavy governments and this complexity, uh, you know, everyone becomes frustrated at how expensive that is and how much time it's wasting and how annoying it is. But the reality is, is that bureaucracy only exists as a function of lack of trust, right? So, so for example, for example, one of the things that happened with the recent uh, COVID-19 phenomenon in the United States is the uh, payroll protection, right? So the PPP loan program, right? And if you look at, if you go to a place like PayPal and you apply for a PPP loan, you basically fill out like a web-based online form and then they throw money at you, right? Uh, which is astonishingly not bureaucratic, right? And, but here's the funny part. The funny part is, is that in a way they've just, they're kind of throwing caution to the winds. It's not very bureaucratic because they're in a hurry, right? They're in a hurry. And even if you're a scam artist and you're taking money from the government illegally, right? There's two, there's two notions. Like one notion is, is we'll get you later, right? So one notion is kind of like, you better not defraud the government or at some point they're gonna find you and be like, this is, this is wrong. Now you're gonna go to jail, right? So that's, that's one aspect of this. But the other aspect of it is, is that they just want to create Keynesian acceleration you know, and if you defrauded them and then you later on like went and bought a bunch of things on Amazon, you're still stimulating the economy, right? So I, the, the reason why I'm going to such great lengths is I want people to understand that it's easiest to run a centralized database. That's the easiest thing to do. And it's, it's super, super scalable. Like people talk about, oh, it's the blockchain. It's, you know, how many transactions per second is not very scalable. It's like, wow, I can give you a million transactions per second. I just have to go run an Oracle database, you know, with a lot of RAM and like, it's, that'll go real well, right? One node, right? Just a big giant box, you know, with a huge RAM cache, everything's going great. But so, so the, the reason why I'm going through this lengthy explanation is I just want to explain that enterprise blockchain has to always suffer from this weird question. And the question always has to be, why, why aren't you using Oracle database instead of this blockchain? Like why, why, why are you, like, why are you like bothering Zoom. to use this, this? Yeah, why are you using this crazy multi-party co computation with all this kind of like checking and validation? Because the, the concept is, is that the whole idea of an enterprise is that an enterprise is essentially a brand. And it's, it, what is the concept of the brand? A brand is just a promise, right? And so what's the enterprise value? The enterprise value of that brand is simply the expectation that they will deliver that promise. That's it, right? And so the point is, is what is that expectation? That's trust, right? So you don't expect like a centralized bank to basically defraud you because that's not what the business they're in. Like you, you, you assume that they have better ways of making business than to like steal your money and then like laugh at you. I mean, you know, that that has happened in the history of banking, but like, <laughs> you know, oh, generally in the times. first world, we don't expect it. So to make a long story short, what I'm really trying to say here is, is that to be fair to my colleagues, uh, you know, I'm not against private or public chains, uh, but I do think that enterprise blockchain should always, the, anyone doing an enterprise blockchain should ask themselves why it's not being done. I, I, to be even more open source, you could say, why is this not being done in Postgres or MySQL? Like those are great databases, or, or MongoDB for that matter. So like, you know, I'm, I'm happy with Cassandra. I'm happy with all the databases. Go ahead and use one. But like, <laughs> we're, we're not going to go to your blockchain? technical technique because I know you're, you're very keen on this. Like, <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, let, I like let's... nerdy stuff. <laughs> Yes, no, which I which I love you about that. But like, I, I want us also to, um, you know, there, there's a lot of like basic uh, notions where people just want to understand what are the good examples? What are the like practical 
working products that are, you know, they're changing the antiquated uh, infrastructure already. Maybe you can just give us like, you know, some yeah, of your absolutely, experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, you know, there to me, the thing that is so important to understand about this infrastructure, which is blockchain based open financial infrastructure is that it has to either store or transmit or transmute value right and perhaps compute value through things like smart contracts but it has to have something to do with value and if it's not doing those things then you might as well be using other technologies right because we have like many many years of technologies that are great at transmitting information and storing information so with that aside then the question becomes what are the practical applications for this that are actually working today you know um for example ripple is working with moneygram and one of the things they're handling is they're actually handling one of a very very significant international remittance application uh, using, I think, of, of one of the really popular country pairs is actually United States to Mexico and, and vice versa, right? And when you think about international remittance, um, we know that Ripple is handling a significant percentage now of the international remittance between this inside of this country pair uh, over, uh, you know, over the Ripple uh, network over XRP. So. You know that's exciting uh another kind of uh money transfer application involves uh a stable coin and uh this is actually um the signature bank so signature bank in new york is actually using a technology provider called tacit and tacit is uh part of the gumi cryptos capital portfolio companies mm -hmm. but what it does is it basically has this project called signet so Signet is is really simple. It's just a competitor to Fedwire. So Fedwire basically allows sort of intra-bank transfer. So if you're a bank customer, you know, the thing that's really interesting in the case of Signet is if you're a bank customer and you're wiring money to another bank customer, um, you've already done full KYC because you have both ends. Right, they're both bank customers. So why would you need to go all the way up through Fedwire and then pay more and also have it take days to transfer? Why wouldn't you just do it instantaneously? Right. So mm -hmm. that particular application uh, at Signature Bank is doing billions of dollars worth of transactions. It's a tremendously successful application. And I think that that ends up going towards a much more sophisticated set of applications that have to do with kind of automating uh, things like e-commerce or automating supply chains or automating enterprise uh, B2B commerce, right? Because what happens in B2B commerce is, is how do you handle payments? And the way that you handle payments today between enterprises is basically accounts payable, accounts receivable, invoicing, purchase orders, net 30, you know, like it, it's just really crazy kind of you know, and, and there are even weird float businesses of cash management, right? There's even, so so financial officers have these kind of complex float and cash management applications that, you know, and then they have lending against receivables. Like it, it's, your head explodes. That's where that game goes, right? Which is, you know, not only is instant remittance across borders possible, but instant payment across companies is possible, right? And these are great applications and what you're no, probably noticing about what I'm saying is I'm, I'm really talking about simple, really simple financial applications. Oh, for sure. And uh, so if I would like probably to summarize what you just uh, said, that uh, who would compare like someone like someone like uh, Chase JP Morgan, right? You know, commercial bank that actually provides us, you know, like you can go and uh, cash out like you know, USD and then um, it's a traditional banking system that works you know well for you know many years and we can call it like so to speak an analog world right and then we're now getting slowly to la layer number one where you have the fiat to crypto right, or vice versa crypto to uh, fiat exchange you know whether you're using coinbase or evercoin right so you you can go then and buy let's say for your dollars you know your again digital dollars right you can buy let's say bitcoin or ethereum right then you go deeper yeah. then you go the public 
blockchain you go to metamask or and then you can just you know uh store let's say your ethereum uh, and then you're going to the next level which we call from analog the transformation from analog to digital world which is open finance infrastructure and there's like different uh different uh, i would say categories there right you know you can talk about stable coins as you mentioned tokenization you know different derivatives you know like lending and multiple applications but in essence if uh, if i would if i understood you correctly what uh, like the two major points is that you there's instant payments meaning like you you win the speed number one and you don't have to ask anyone anything like you can just like in a few minutes like you can transfer like uh, money and receive money and second you save fees because it actually makes in like the obsolete like intermediaries like you know disappear right you know you now do it in a more efficient way right hugely more efficient okay so perfect you see we we clarified at least something today <laughs> Well, I mean, when I say when I say this, when I say this, like you know, when you talk about things like cross-border remittance, right? Uh, it's really in the same thing as kind of like what I, I mean. It's not the same thing, but like if you look at e, e, you know business-to-business -business payments, right? What's really happening is that you're seeing this. It's a bureaucracy, right? And 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 so like it's like and the idea is is why is there a bureaucracy? There's a bureaucracy because the parties don't have trust. So the thing that's so interesting is, is that blockchain actually enables you to have a trustless fabric of transaction. So you don't actually have to trust, you know, obviously there's, there remains counterparty risk, right? So if, if I send you a Bitcoin, right? Like you can run away with it. You know, if I'm buying something from you using a Bitcoin, you know, obviously there's still counterparty trust, but I don't have to trust the fabric. I don't have to trust anyone who's in, in between, right? And so to me, the thing that's really intriguing though, is what if you can extend the trust yet further, right? So what if you have two business partner companies that are operating through the same banking institution, like Signature Bank, right? How much bureaucracy should you even need? Like you should not need much, right? You shouldn't yeah. need net 30 payments and you shouldn't need you shouldn't need all this kind of crazy cash management apparatus you should just pay like you know and if you want to delay the payment for any reason like that's fine just put it into a smart contract and the payment will be delayed but like most people won't care about that you know i i think in the future the idea that you're delaying a payment by 30 days it's like why are you doing that like I don't want you to do that I just want you to pay I just want to, I'll give you the value you give me the payment like let's go well that's that's a trick you know like it's a I I, I wrote an article recently about this like uh comparing like uh, the the modern recession like, which I which I uh think we all can agree that it's a global recession it's not just a local one anymore and uh that it's a uh, unfortunately it's like uh, you, you you're trying to be very like politically correct here when you're saying like it's bureaucratic and efficient i would say it's just a it's a pure lie it's a ma mafia uh like you know corrupt organization with people who are actually uh you know the the they actually control the system and they know that there are better and more efficient solutions and they artificially slow like you know slow the process like as we've seen in history like with for example tesla right you know nikola tesla uh yeah. solutions but people knew this like you know probably over a hundred years ago like you know and like it was blocked you know this uh this inventions you know the they, they never seen the world because guess what the oil cartels did not want to see it right so similar that's happening to traditional banking system we see central banks who are now slowly getting uh into like creation of their national currencies and national like dig digitization of their currencies and, and creating stable coins commercial banks are now using different exchanges and then investment banks are trying to use the open financial infrastructure um, and my question to you is probably like where do you see the future if you would if you were to bet on the like you know certain niche certain aspect of the public blockchain infrastructure would you say that let's say something like non-sovereign money creation as a macroeconomic algo monetary policy will will be a winner or let's say dig, dig, digitization of value like something like you know fiat conversion to grow to crypto or let's say native uh, digital um 
tokens will win. I'm just curious your your bet. Yeah, so uh, I look at it is it's very simple. Uh, I think that if you look at the way open source software has kind of taken over, right? Uh, Mark Andreessen says that software is eating the world, right? It's very clear that open source software is eating software. So the thing that it, as it happens is, is it, it's almost like 90% of software is open source software. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the most valuable companies in the world, all you're going to see are companies that are beneficiaries of open source software. Right. So Apple, Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, Facebook, like you name it, they're all huge beneficiaries. You know, 90% of their code that they have, you know, is, is lines of open source software, um, you know, because the really important, you know, things. If you look at like Google, a lot of their storage is like MariaDB, which is, you know, MySQL. So there's tons of open source, right? But the point being as follows, which is that some of the beneficiaries like Apple and Amazon are actually kind of, I would call the non-contributing beneficiaries. So they're, they're organizations who get the benefit of open source, but they tend to contribute less back. They don't give as much back. And I, you know, I, obviously there are people that work at Apple and Amazon that do contribute a lot, you know, they're the, I don't want to offend them, but like, you know, if, if you look at the real big com contributors, like Google's a huge contributor, Microsoft, it turns out is turned, has turned into a huge contributor to open source, uh, you know, and then obviously like Netflix is massive and open source, you know, and so, but what's my point? My point is, is when you look at open source financial infrastructure, what you're going to find is you're going to find that like, why do people embrace open source at all? And it's so simple, which is that it lowers the cost. It lowers the infrastructure cost, right? So it, what it means is it means that the cost of doing business gets cheaper for everyone. And who cares about that? It's simple, which is the, the lower the cost of entry, the higher the rate of innovation on top of the platform. Right. That's so all, what you're doing is you're basically lowering the cost for everyone. Uh, so my question is, is who's going to not benefit from lowering the cost? Right. So to me, it's almost like describing the Wild West as belonging to like there, there there's only the quick and the dead. Right. So, you know, if you look at the quick and the dead, what you're what I'm saying is, is there's only going to be organizations that embrace open source financial infrastructure, and then there will be dead ones, right? Because what you're really giving up is you're giving up the benefits of cheaper infrastructure. So it's like, who would do that? Like, that's an ignorant thing to do, right? Now the question becomes like, has that happened in the history of companies? Of course it has. Like there's tons oh, yeah. of software companies that are just dead. Like, you know, like for example, uh, there was a networking company that weirdly enough, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, worked at called Novell, right? So Novell actually had a proprietary network protocol that competed with TCP IP, with the internet protocol. Amazing, right? Good luck with that. Goodbye, right? Like it, it's, it, <laughs> that's not a functional business plan, right? And so I guess what I'm saying is, is like, is there a history of people that have resisted open source and have kind of fought it tooth and nail and said, we're going to keep this proprietary. Of course they have, but like they didn't do well. So, so if you look at things like banking, everyone's going to embrace it. Everyone has to embrace it. And, and you're seeing everyone embracing it. You're seeing like people's bank of China, world's largest, uh, central bank has embraced this, uh, digital payments, uh, based on blockchain, uh, all the way up to, uh, Xi Jinping. Who, is, who has said, you know, blockchain is a key strategic initiative uh, for Belt and Road, and it's a key national imperative on the same level as something like AI. So like, you know, and China has been tremendous in AI. So like, you know, so it's, it's an amazing thing. So, you know, really when you think about the uh, level of embrace, you know, you're seeing it, all these national, like central banks eyeballing digital central banking through blockchain based technology. And I kind of feel like, well, you got to benefit from that lower cost or 
get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always like that. Like it's, uh, I think it's an evolution process, right? So um, if we come back to some of your project that you were involved with, you know, uh, uh, we mentioned that you were one of the co-founders of Evercoin, and as I understand, it's uh, it's a non-custodial exchange. And if you can just say a few words, what is the unique uh, value proposition behind the non-custodial exchange, and what's the difference between the you know custodial exchange and non-custodial? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Evercoin is uh, you know it's a mobile application, so you know you can download it on Android and iOS. Uh, it is really the best and simplest way that people can maintain custody. And so, you know, when I say that, when I say that, you know, there's so many different pitfalls, right? There's a there's an old fable, Aesop's fables, and the, the quote the quote that comes from there is, uh, I think, a fool and his money are soon parted, right? So it really means that people who aren't able to maintain or keep track of their money is they, they're parted from their the, that value right and I think that that's really kind of a core way of looking at the value of having your own wallet right because when you have your own wallet then you have really kind of true ownership uh, you know the thing that's so funny about um, you know I, I as a hedge I actually also own a little bit of gold. Uh, but what's funny is I don't own physical gold, uh, you know, so I, I don't have, uh, you know, any gold under my bed or, you know, in the back, in the backyard, in a chest, you know, this kind of thing. I don't have any of that stuff, right? Because if you think about what that optimizes for, it optimizes for a weird situation, right? Which is it optimizes for kind of this Mad Max world where people are buying what are they buying they're buying uh gasoline and ammunition and food with gold you know it's just very weird right but if you come back to bitcoin the idea that you actually maintain custody physical custody over bitcoin which is done electronically through a wallet um that's different that's quite a different proposition you know and what i mean by it's quite a different proposition is is that that's really participation in an emerging alternative internet money. And I think at, at a bare minimum, even if you have a tiny amount of Bitcoin that's in your own custody, just for fun, like if you had like $10 or $5 worth of Bitcoin in your own custody, it it's still worth doing. And it's still worth doing because that's the future of self-sovereignty, of privacy, of identity, of finance, you know, and the thing that we've been able to do successfully at Evercoin is uh, we actually integrated this device. So this device is the YubiKey 5CI. It has a lightning port on one side and it has a USB-C port on the other side. And it turns out that it just neatly plugs right into your phone. Right. So what's really cool about this is, is that it actually handles your cryptographic keys for you in a way that's uh, extremely consumer friendly. So, you know, one of the things that's exciting about what we've been able to develop is a way for normal people to actually own and have custody over cryptographic assets like Bitcoin, uh, Ether, uh, Ripple, like all the all the popular once quick question if i steal your your uh you the key like can i can i uh, have a possession of your crypto assets ah you can't and the reason why is that it's all multi-factor right it's all multi-factor so you know in addition you would also also need my fingerprints you know so that, okay. that's 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 easy right. i'm gonna cut your fingers so that's fine yeah 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 <laughs> so uh one of the things that's hard to resist in uh cryptographic custody is uh, this famous so-called wrench attack, right? Which is if you physically get a hold of a person, uh, it's it's kind of like taking the person to an ATM machine and having them withdraw cash, right? So at that point, I think that's a, that's still we're still you know in these physical bodies, so there there are certain sure. limitations, uh, you know. But but um, 
we're even we're even exploring use cases like that. So we haven't implemented things like this, but it's even possible to have a trapdoor wallet. So you could actually have a wallet where you can open it and then it shows that you only have ten dollars worth of bitcoins. You know, and then there's a secret way to actually open the real one, which has mm. like a huge amount, you know. So, so they, you know, so there and are. And you activate even, it with your left finger instead of the right finger, you know? There may be mysterious ways, right? There may be ways <laughs> to kind of like uh, signal duress or there may be UI mechanisms. We haven't implemented things like that because, in general, we don't really optimize for that use case. Uh, you know, we don't think it's right. common. Uh, but, uh, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, we really do want to optimize for use cases that are common, you know, and so common use cases are things like the user has lost their own key because they wrote it down somewhere and they don't know where they wrote it or or oh, I've been the paper there. that it was written on uh, got got water on it and you can't read it anymore, you know, things like that. And so we have like a backup system for that, uh, a non-custodial backup system, which is really great. So Evercoin can help you back up. This is a patent pending technology. So we can back up your private key without ever having your private key, you know, and it has to do with, uh, you know, sharding technology is a bit like uh, Shamir secret sharing, but it's a, it's a really, uh, it's cool stuff, right? But the the long and the short version is is that it's uh, the hardware key is just one of the factors, but it acts like essentially a hotel key, right? Which is you put it in and it unlocks, and you take it out and it locks, it relocks. And in fact, mm -hmm. it's even but it's it's so much like a hotel key in that if you lose the hardware key, you can actually KYC to the exchange and actually have a new key issued. Right, so it's it's really uh, it's it's phenomenally consumer grade, but it's also kind of what I would characterize as bank grade, right? Because the, mm -hmm. if you have a backup and you lose the backup, right? Uh, so you've lost so many things. You could you could lose the password, you could lose the private key, you could lose you can take the YubiKey hardware key, throw it in the Pacific Ocean. You can take your phone and throw it in the Atlantic Ocean, and even in that scenario, you can recover your funds because you go to the last 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 resort which is uh you kyc back to the exchange so you basically come back and you're like here's my government id here's my face id this is who i am you know be believe me this is impressive day. this is actually impressive because i i personally lost you know like one bitcoin like that i was just moving to another yep. apartment and yep. uh my seeds you know like <laughs> see they yep. were lost and i don't know how it happened they like they were in a place where I couldn't even think that they would be lost. But listen, that was an expensive uh, uh, lesson for me. And I tried to restore it with uh, the uh, different methods that you provided. And uh, uh, a wallet, uh, I don't want to uh, put a bad uh, publicity <laughs> like on them, but they, yeah. they didn't yeah, allow yeah. me that. Like they just so course, told me, like, listen, of course. I'm, I, we're, we're, we're very sorry. Like this is like and by the way, a lesson and, for you. And, and yeah. by the way, and by the way, there's nothing up my sleeve. And what I mean is this, what I mean is this, is that we actually take your shard, right? Which is in fact, uh, basically it, it uh, when you're saying shard is like a swear word you know maybe try to explain and then simplify yeah, yeah yeah so here's what happens here's what happens is is that there's there's a number it's a really big complicated number that looks like a bunch of letters and numbers all mashed together and this this string of characters really represents your cryptographic private key right that's the key to the kingdom that allows you to access the blockchain and get your funds right so so what we do is we mathematically break it into two pieces. And so the point is, is once it's broken into two pieces, like neither piece by itself can actually cause you. So the holder of each piece has really nothing until it combines with the other piece. Right. And so like my point is correct. Correct. And so what we do is we take you take your piece and you actually uh, back it up into uh, iCloud and you also back it up into email, right? And the point that's great about this is, is that your piece, anyone, a hacker can get your piece and it doesn't matter. Like it's, it's, it's like, uh, I can see on the Bitcoin blockchain that somebody has 10 Bitcoins, but I can't access those because I don't have anything, right? So the point is, is even if I get your backup, I'm only having half, right? And so, but also, let's say that some hacker 
somehow gets into Evercoin and they get into all of our storage, you know, our cold storage, right? They don't have anything yet either, right? Because they would also need to penetrate each customer's, you know, backup, and then they would need to recombine them, you know, in a way that's not, that's inobvious, by the way, like we, we don't publish the mathematics of recombining these, right? So, so the point I, is, no, is that, 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 that's it's, fascinating. It's, it's highly, highly, highly uh, difficult secure. to, yeah, it's, it's very beautifully secure. It's very elegant. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, um, it's, it seems like one of the great things about talking with you about it is, is that you felt the pain, right? You've had oh, the yeah. painful experience, right? And so, you know, the thing that's amazing, you know, I, I think if you're, if you're a first time listener and, and you're not involved at all and you haven't had this experience, you're kind of thinking like, wow, this, this guy's full of complicated talk and he's full of like these complicated <laughs> ideas, you know? And, and the point that I'm making is, is in a way, I was never a big, I was never big into cybersecurity. I was never in, you know, until Bitcoin time. And now I'm starting to really appreciate and understand it, you know, because uh, yeah, hackers are real, you know, and, and we have to protect, you know, assets. And so for me, uh, I've kind of reluctantly become a bit of a cybersecurity nerd, um, mm -hmm. not, a, not a practitioner, like a chief security officer type person, but like, you know, just a casually interested person, you know. And, oh, no, you have so, to be. Yeah, you have to be, especially nowadays, like it, they're becoming more active. I mean, by the way, you and me we were chatting about this like publicly on Facebook, like, you know, you were impersonated several times uh, and yes. I had the same problem, like, you know, during the coronavirus, it happened to me two times already. So uh, I, I'm sure there are a lot of f folks who are experiencing the same uh, issues, you know, like, because, you know, it's it's so easy You can replicate an account like in Facebook and Telegram and and you cannot do anything about it. Like, you know, what they're going to do, they're going to go after your friends and they try to ask where, oh, I'm having a trouble. Please send me a few bitcoins. And that's all right. So at this yes. point, you cannot like, you know, it, unless you just prevent like and notify all your friends and they're smart enough like to even double check, uh, which hope like my friends, like I'm lucky to have like smart friends. <laughs> so nobody were, were uh, like, uh, we're getting this, like two people immediately wrote me back saying that hey, this is, you know, somebody is doing that. But that's in so, some ways, that's the worst kind of attack on, on your network, right? Because it feels like the person who has the kindest feelings towards you will be the most ripped off right like it's yes. it's really right it's horrible it's really bad right because like and, and you know, they're the very hacker, good at it yeah the hacker's like oh I'm, I'm in trouble i need i need money help me you know and people are like oh i'll help you so it's it's very well, I, yeah. I had i had actually several occasions where my my good friend like actually uh, caught he was the ceo in the company and uh, somebody impersonated he, uh, his, uh, his email, like, and emailed his colleague, and knowing that I don't know how they were so smart, uh, but they they knew that the guy was flying out and he was not in the country and there was no connection. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Maybe because of the time zone, so they they emailed the, to his like C level executive saying like I I I am in trouble. I'm in this country. I I immediately need five thousand dollars. Like please send me wire me this right now. Wow. You can imagine wow. it's coming out from the CEO oh, account. Yes. And uh, of course they bought it unfortunately, but um, so it happens all the time. So I guess like just uh, friendly advice to everyone who's listening, just uh, uh, cybersecurity is very important. And it's not just like for geeks, like or for folks who are, you know, like in the crypto space. No, it's for everyone to protect yourself. Uh, and this, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, another topic we would, would we want to talk about is basically also the investment world with where you are, you know, yep. active like with uh, Gumi Cryptos Fund. And uh, I'm curious to understand what, what what is your investment thesis like? You know, it's a venture capital firm, and I'm sure you have certain parameters how you even source the deals, how yes. you due diligence them. So please tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our thesis is uh, what I call L-shaped. So, you know, if you look at the capital letter L, there's a horizontal component and there's a vertical component, right? So the horizontal component really consists of all of the protocol layers, right? So whether it's deep protocol, like consensus. So we've invested in, for example, something like Space Mesh, which is kind of like this new novel proof of space time consensus sort of competes with 
sort of typical proof of work or proof of stake consensus algorithms, you know. So we, we invest in the deepest layers, but we also invest in kind of potentially horizontal, more superficial layers of protocol, right? So we're really looking at things like, for example, Agoric is an investment we made and they provide uh, essentially JavaScript based smart contract programming on top of a number of different uh, blockchains, notably uh, Cosmos, but it's a really interesting technology. Um, so I guess smart contract technology, you know, so we're looking at things like identity, um, biometric identity on the blockchain. Uh, we invested in uh, keyless, um, alternative uh, security token and security token inspired uh, sort of uh, capital formation. So, you know, we, we invested in something called a better exchange or Abe, uh, so we, we have a bunch of different uh, components, all of which I think are kind of platform technologies, horizontal. But when you talk about the L shape, what's vertical? So for us, what's vertical is um, the financial services industry, right? So, you know, we're very interested in financial services, whether they be decentralized financial services. So for example, um, Vega protocol we invested in, and Vega is very much kind of in the mood of building uh, derivatives uh, in a decentralized model. But we also actually are paying attention to blockchain-based applications for centralized finance. And you know, I mentioned Tacit, so they have a signature bank, and that's a centralized implementation, uh, which we also believe in. So from our from our side. Uh, you know, we do believe that there may be other early adopter verticals. One of the ones that we do look into uh, is the gaming segment. So we have uh, gaming investments um, in things like OpenSea, which is a marketplace for non-fungible tokens, uh, the largest. And then we also have a couple other ones called Bling Financial, which is sort of a consumer Bitcoin incentivized gaming, mobile gaming platform. Uh, that one's pretty fun. Uh, you know, so we have some gaming investments. Uh, so really, when you look at the vertical part, financial services and gaming, we think are pretty much the vertical part. We see so many other industries that are kind of maybe too early. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. No, sure, and I and I think it's important to be laser focused, and I'm happy that you know like those projects are working out great for you, and I, I wish them only you know prosperity. So, uh, but if let's say someone who's listening right now, like you know, if, if they're entrepreneurs and they're trying to uh, to build another great platform or something like in cybersecurity world, that's connected to uh, your investment thesis. Like, what would be the your advice, your guidelines that you would provide them? Like, how to fundraise from you guys? Absolutely. So uh, we actually do have some content on our blog that, in some ways, describes it. I had one of my portfolio company CEOs tell me that. I was wrong to do that. Uh, it's so funny because his his attitude Why? is basically this: is is if you teach people how to pitch you, then they're just going to be fake and they're just going to pitch you in a way that you like, but that may actually have nothing to do with their real capabilities and company, right? But uh, you know, I I take a different uh, mindset, right? Which is my my mindset is is that we just want to put it out there. Uh, we do think that we're part of a broader ecosystem. And we just want to put it out there for the purposes of really education of entrepreneurs, right? So to me, like what is in the mind, you know, of a VC, you know, I can tell you that it's fascinating because I, the reason why I can say it is, is because I've only been one for a couple of years and I've been an entrepreneur, you know, the whole rest of my career, you know, for decades, right? So, so you know, the thing that's really important to understand about the mind of kind of an investor and how to kind of crack it is, you know, ultimately it has to come down to conviction, right? And so when you look at conviction, conviction really has to do with kind of two elements. Like one of the elements is kind of ticking boxes, right? So you kind of have to fit a framework and every fund has its own framework, right? So for us, like, you know, we're, relatively early stage we do like things like series a but like you know for us things like traction team you know uh we're really interested in kind of runway which also includes conversations about revenue you know so if you're in revenue and in, in products uh you know obviously the team matters a ton uh you know and then obviously at the end of taking all the boxes there's another phenomenon that doesn't really happen in 
the brain as much as it happens more in the gut, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about conviction, you know, the final switch to flip is really that gut level flip, that switch, you know, and, and the switch is really related to kind of understanding that this deal is going to happen, right? That, that the train is going to leave the station, you know, if the investor's in it or not, like, you know, that's their decision, right? Like, you know, the, the, this deal is getting done. Once you've done that to an investor, you know, and obviously like there's plenty of entrepreneurs who are like Y Combinator train that come in the door and say, oh, we're closing next Friday, get in or out, and you know, just really try to hustle you, you know, and if there's not time for us to do our process, then we'll just pass, right? Because the thing that it turns out is it turns out that there's plenty of fish in the sea. And so, you know, we don't, we don't FOMO too much. Uh, you know, we, we don't, we, FOMO's fear of missing out. So as a fund, if someone tries to hustle us and say, you gotta, you gotta invest now or, or, or never, uh, you know, then we're usually happy to say never, <laughs> you know, we're usually like, okay, that's fine. So, so, you know, Good. so don't try to, don't try to rush our process, uh, you know, uh, but at the same time, you know, try to create a conviction that your deal is not only fundable, but it's actually getting funded. So that's, that's, so that's quick, big. quick clarification. So you, would you, uh, would you invest in international projects or let's say you're focused on us only? Uh, we, we're able, we have a, you know, we have a very broad charter. We have the capability of investing in a variety of different assets, a variety of different domiciles and geographies. Uh, you know, obviously our significant preference is sort of, uh, you know, geographically closer, ideally. So, you know, if we can, uh, you know, drive over to the entrepreneur's office, you know, it's more ideal. Obviously in COVID, you, everything is Zoom anyway. But, you know, I think in the big picture, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for example, uh, we, we led a recent round in a UK-based company called Credo that is doing some very, very novel second layer technology that helps with both custody and performance. Those are really deep tech guys. Uh, and I earlier mentioned Keyless and, you know, we led that one, which is headquartered in Rome. So, you know, mm -hmm. we, we definitely have uh, the ability to invest in Europe. We have the ability to invest in Asia, which we also have, and we have the ability to invest in North America. We haven't done Africa. We haven't done Latin America. We've seen deals from both of those regions, but we just haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet. Yet. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. So uh, that brings us, you know, probably to uh, to me uh, the most uh, fun question. You know, like uh, we've been through different cycles and different crazy times in the industry. So, can you share your the most interesting and uh, like you, you can say craziest story that happened to you in the industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I think one of the domiciles that became of great regulatory interest early in the crypto uh, world was um, Switzerland, right? One of the things that's amazing about Switzerland is that they have such a highly federated system that you have cantons that have kind of tremendous amount of independence and are able to forge sort of regulatory principles very quickly. And it also has mm -hmm. a tremendous history with things like anonymity and with financial services and banking. So, you know, Switzerland became this, this fantastic kind of place to go. And so, you know, it turned into this whole crypto valley, you know, in Zug, which is right outside mm -hmm. of Zurich. And so, you know, I was going to go. So I had this pl uh, trip all planned. We were going to visit like a couple dozen companies there, you know, all these great uh, crypto valley companies. But um, as I was headed to the airport, uh, you know, I was getting pretty close to parking my car and my cell phone kind of lost signal, right? And the thing that was interesting was, was I actually knew what it was when it happened. Because as it was happening, I was thinking to myself, what are the odds that I'm very close to San Francisco International Airport? and there's no cell tower and there's no cell coverage, right? Like the, the odds are zero. Like it's like, that's not what's happening. Yeah. That's the wrong model of what's happening. What's happening is I'm currently being, uh, I'm under a SIM swap attack. So basically oh, wow. my, my mental model is, you know, so I knew what it was, right? So I'm like, okay, this is bad. 
you know. And so what I what I did is I kind of immediately went to the parking garage and I talked to the attendant and I said, you know, can I use your office phone? You know, so I called my phone provider, you know, and I immediately started trying to wrestle back my account, right? Because, you know, as soon as we got into, you know, that, that, you know, I got a SMS message saying, you know, hey, you know, you've changed your, your phone number on your SIM, oh, wow. you know, and so, yes, yeah, so I, I underwent this, this uh, kind of an attack. So, you know, that was a really wild time for me. And, you know, that was kind of the time when I was sensitized to cybersecurity, because the thing that was so interesting is, is that uh, it took me probably 12 to 15 minutes to reestablish kind of KYC and to kind of get access back to my phone service and have it switched back to my phone. And in that time window, the uh, hackers had compromised uh, two Gmail accounts, uh, my Facebook account, you know, and they already wow. gotten into a number of accounts in a very short amount of time. So I, I was very... You didn't have the double authentication? Right, exactly. No, uh, uh, what I had was I had SMS-based, like, account recovery and authentication. So uh -huh. if you have SMS-based account recovery, like, that's bad. Like, uh -huh. like you need to remove that, uh, you know. And I have, I have, uh, I've blogged about that uh, on on the Evercoin uh, blog. Evercoin. Com. I've blogged about kind of how you can secure your accounts better. But you know, I, I think to me the the best thing you can do for yourself actually is to get one of these uh, UB keys. I actually have several. I have like a traditional USB and then I have like this mobile USB, you know, so I, ha I have multiple, I have backup copies of those two. Uh, so like, mm -hmm. you know, to me, like uh, all of this stuff uh, starts, you know, raising your consciousness about how you can kind of improve the security of your infrastructure, you know, so, uh, but it's amazing. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing world, uh, you know, uh, I later received a phone call from someone who who claimed to be the hackers, and you know, oh, we, wow. had a, we had we had a conversation. Did um, they ask you to, like, you know, to send to wire the money or to send the bitcoins or what did they? No, it was an interesting conversation. They basically were trying <laughs> to recruit me, uh, so they were basically saying that if I were to uh, uh, give them high value targets who own bitcoins that they would give me a commission so they were basically trying to get me to wow. participate in their uh hacking the audacity wow what did you reply uh i was like i'm not gonna do anything of the sort <laughs> but you know they, it would actually be uh it would be like if you reply i know that at a time it is like it's shocking but if you reply reverse engineer and if you say yes okay and then you call the you know the fbi and say like listen i i like i got approached by these guys like and then you help them to investigate oh, the fbi, it. The FBI it. did the fbi did take an interest in my case uh there's also uh Santa Clara County has the React Task Force. They actually have a, a mm. very specialized uh, group of people that are interested in things like identity theft, interested in cybersecurity and cybercrime. So, you know, we, there are definitely both federal and local resources uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, that that really do take an interest in this type of uh, activity. And, and you know, sure. the thing that's really great is that a lot of these folks, it turns out, are actually not actually as sophisticated as they seem they're really just using tool chain like they actually have like really good mm. tool chain which uh is available uh, in open source <laughs> you know so you, you can actually get all kinds of account cracking and you know sim swapping things and it turns out that a lot of employees of phone companies are can be bribed you know because they're all probably getting minimum wage and you know so yeah. for them to kind of like take take a little side money and port someone's phone without that person's permission like or, you know that's that could be a thing so. well or not or or not a little money you remember the case of michael turpin right when he was yes. like, he lost like a lot of money right i don't yeah. remember the lawsuit but it was like i think he won a lawsuit against at t for more than 80 million if i'm not mistaken like, yeah 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 i think there's a large degree of kind of punitive damages uh, embedded in that 
in that. Uh, but I don't. I, I think it hasn't fully resolved yet. But you know, he's yeah, he's definitely won, as well. he's won he's won a few layers. Like it, it hasn't been summarily dismissed, which is what AT and T requested. So you know, it's definitely going to trial, and it's it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that that turns out. Yeah, we can wish him only luck. <laughs> uh, so uh, on a positive note, right? So uh, if you were to uh, to advise, you know, uh, a great book for people who want to either get involved into the, into the industry or maybe uh, plug into like a certain specific niche, uh, what would that be? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the book of Satoshi. I think it's a fantastic <laughs> book. It's a <laughs> tremendous read it's literally kind of a compiled writings and a lot of the writings were either chased down through private emails that were given to specific individuals like gavin and drayson or like uh you know others who are in the kind of inner circle satoshi nakamoto hal finney like you know the estate of hal finney uh you know so there's a number of like prominent individuals that were in the early Bitcoin community and cypherpunk community that actually were uh, participated in the creation of this book. But of course, there's also, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, the Bitcoin uh, email group. So, you know, what you got get to see is you really get to see the mindset of the founder. Uh, and it's really the person who is writing, you know, emails as you know satoshi and you know so the the fascinating thing is that you can get a glimpse into the mindset of the creator so you know for me that was tremendously instrumental in kind of helping me understand the culture the ethos you know and the mindset behind this extremely seminal invention right because the thing that i think is tremendous about the bitcoin blockchain is that it has so many layers of innovation that all beautifully interact so it's it's a tremendous techni technological achievement and you know the benefit of it is it also happens to kind of read you know almost like a mystery novel because the truth is so much stranger than fiction right which is the truth is is that nobody still knows i i don't care what the uh, you know McAfee says or anything like I don't think anybody knows who Satoshi is uh, and I don't care what Craig Wright has to say about it either but like you know I, I think that uh, Satoshi remains to this day anonymous pseudonymous and like um, what a tremendous achievement what a, what a great achievement what an incredible technology what an amazing mind and um, what a interesting intriguing character so I, I highly recommend the book of Satoshi no, it's like I, I I would agree. That's a great read. And uh, uh, in terms of the people, like you know, who you would recommend to follow, also to you know, for their great achievements, you know, like in the industry, who would that be? Like you know, well, there's a, a number of tremendously fascinating figures. Uh, you know, there to me it r runs the gamut. But I would say, you know, uh, if you if you read the book uh, Bitcoin Billionaires, there's actually like a, you get tremendous access to some of the early pioneers. Obviously, the early pioneers are wonderful. Uh, so, you know, you look at uh, the Winklevoss. Uh, Cameron and Tyler, the the twins, right? Obviously, they're incredibly influential in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. Some of the early pioneers, uh, Eric Voorhees, Charlie Shrem, Roger Veer, uh, those are all like very kind of seminal figures in kind of the Bitcoin uh, space, uh, pioneers. And then, you know, obviously, uh, you know, when you start to go above and beyond that, like there are certainly like many insightful kind of people providing perspective. Uh, you know, I find uh, Jimmy Song to be very uh, important in terms of the way he's educating people about core Bitcoin functioning and the open source dynamics around it. Uh, you know, uh, so, so some of them are almost translators, I'd say, um, you know, Antonopoulos, he's like very important. Uh, and his book, Mastering Bitcoin is, is exceptional. Um, obviously, it requires a little bit of coding knowledge, but like, you know, I think it's a very beautifully concise description of the protocol layer itself. So, you know, I think those are those are great. And obviously, like you can expand your circle beyond just Bitcoin and start looking into, you know, Ethereum and you can start looking into some of these alt protocols as well. But, you know, I, from, from my perspective, if you don't, if you're new and you haven't understood much you should start with bitcoin like you, you, if you don't understand bitcoin it's hard for you to understand 
uh, altcoins. You know, like, like you really have to start there. No, hundred uh, percent. And look, I, I, I think you know we've covered like uh, a lot of uh, fascinating topics, and uh, uh, it's been a great pleasure. You know, it's always a pleasure to hear your thoughts on the industry and. Uh, we'll leave uh, uh, the links to your blog, you know, to Gumi Crypto uh, uh, Capital, and then you know we can read more about you know your investment thesis and your guidelines, and obviously share the the link to Evercoin. Like it was really uh, uh, interesting to hear, like you know how secure and fast it is, like uh, and convenient, I would say. Uh, and uh, generally, like really appreciate your outlook. It's always uh, uh, good to hear from you, and really appreciate your time, Nico. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you.